Hey. Hey. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, somewhere around with Jitsi. Well, we still only have five people. I don't know what happened to everyone else. Right. Let me see if I can send an email real quick. Did Anson get the? I don't know, yeah, he he, okay. he knows it one way or the other. Um, and I, I know Andrew's a friend of mine also. Okay. Um, who I did my onboarding lab manager duties last night somewhat and encouraged her to stop by. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, you're here. Okay. okay. I can. I, I didn't see. You. Let's see. What do you mean? Oh, weird. It only shows. Oh. Are you? Oh. Hold on a second. Just, just, just a moment. All right. So how's everyone doing? I know the <laughs> the uh, technical difficulties are less than impressive, but we'll get over we'll get over those pretty soon here. <laughs> yeah, no worries. That's okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know. Maybe we should inter uh, we should introduce ourselves. Maybe uh, I mean we can do it now because we're actually recording. You're putting this on YouTube for other people to view, but we're going to, you know, uh, why don't we just go through, oh, Jesse, what did you find out? Um, about, about, about what? what? I was oh, always, are right. there other people joining us or? Yeah, yeah Angela, Angela is, is on her way. way. Uh, she, she was lost, lost in the other, other chat, chat, which I figured we could she was on her phone, phone and never did this before. before so yeah. I'm making sure she has the link. Okay. There we go. That's Anson. Okay. Anson. Hello. Hi. Seems like Angela didn't um, join that. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to that. Well, why don't we go around and introduce our, the new people? Introduce yourselves. So go. Yeah, um, I'm Season, and I'm a recent graduate from University of Washington. And um, this year, I'm gonna relocate back to China to work in Institute of Neuroscience. And I my experience has mainly in behavior neuroscience and. Um, on decision making and hippocampus and learning and work memory. Um, yeah, I'll be um, participating in the interactive track in NeuroMesh Academy this summer. Good. Thank you. Um, I think you're also a discussion moderator and you was one of volunteering with them, right? This yeah, I was uh, involved with the video productions and the community management on the NeuroStar website. Yeah, we were talking about that on Slack. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right now, this um, over the weekend, I'm waiting for the people who had Neurostars to set up like a little category for us to host partners. Like when we're, you know, before the meetings, maybe if we have any questions when we're studying that we want, want to discuss, that would be a good way. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, let's. Yeah, keep me posted on that. We'll we'll have more to say. <laughs> so. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I hope to be all updated. Okay. Uh, so, Angela or Bobby? Um, hi. hi. So, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, sweet. I don't have a webcam right now, so that's a bit of an issue. But yeah, I'm Bobby. Um, I just graduated from Brandeis with a degree in neuroscience. I I'm not currently working on anything other than prepping for Neuromatch, but I 
wrote my thesis in my last semester on um, correlations between homeostatic channels and sort of modeling that in vitro in, or in silico and single neurons. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Uh, Angela? Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. I just finished my paper for data science. Sorry, data analysis. Concentrating, I'm sorry, there's a pillow. Um, um, on the I'm policy track, track, concentrating in international social welfare, and I'm um, also having, having a tech, tech minor. minor. Sorry, sorry, it's called emerging, emerging technology, technology, media, and society, society but, but it's basically tech. tech. Okay. okay. That's about it. I'm excited for the match. Oh, good. Glad, glad everyone could be here. Uh, I see Stefan here yeah. is here too. Um, oh, hey, Stefan. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, the meeting today will uh, talk about. Uh, I have a, a lecture I want to give on Bayesian um, things, and it's you know it's a, a conceptual lecture, but it kind of goes over a bunch of things, and it's not ex exhaustive, but we'll talk about. We can talk about it later. Uh, I want to go through that, and then I want to. I guess uh, Jesse had some, maybe some things to talk about. Uh, we also have the epistemological directory that we're creating. Maybe we'll walk through that a little bit too. And then, if anyone wants to talk about anything else, we can. Yeah, I, I would, would just say, say I have. Um, I, I had, had a lot, lot of like. like Bunch of computer updates that decided to happen this morning, so I don't really get to flesh out things on. I don't have like a, I don't have a lot to say about. Uh, like I don't have a lot of material to present, but maybe just like five minutes to talk about direct perception and see if you guys here have comments on that. Um, but it wouldn't be a substantial amount of time. Okay. Well, why don't we uh, actually? Why don't we first go to the epistemological directory? So let me share my screen here. And this will be for um, all right. Here it is. All right, can everyone see my screen now? Yes. All right. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So this is. Uh, what we call an epistemological directory, and um, we uh, actually Jesse and I presented on this at a conference recently. And so the idea here is to have uh, a, like a, a system. It's not really like Wikipedia, but it's a system for people to engage in self-learning. So you have Neuromatch Academy. This is our repository for Neuromatch Academy here in the lab. This is different from the one run by the actual academy, uh, but we're encouraging people to contribute to this uh, directory as a way to sort of bolster self-learning. So uh, Jesse has contributed a lot of things uh, in the last few days. He's issued a couple of multiple requests and we've uh, accommodated those. So how do you use this repo? Um, please, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I, I didn't. I put that in there last night because I think people are coming and might not know. So feel free to like adjust that massively as needed. But no, I think this looks good. Um, it just kind of tells people how to, um, you know, how to contribute resources. Well, it just says to contribute resources, add topics, submit coding examples, create a Jupyter notebook, which is an interactive notebook and embed questions or comments in existing directories. Um, so yeah, that I mean, that also could be done in terms of like uh, issues or the mm -hmm. project. So, I mean, you know, that's something that we can talk about later. I mean, this is like our first one that we've really done that's been like, uh, <laughs> you know, a formal. Um, out in, yeah, out you know, in the wild more so, but yeah. yeah. But anyways, yeah, so we have these topics, and so, like, Bayesian thinking, it doesn't have to be, there's no uniformity to it, but we just have, like, uh, we'll have, like, Bayesian thinking, we'll have a tutorial here, which are slides, if you go to a slideshow here, you'll see that it renders a slideshow, 
Um, you have other topics like neural networks. And for that, we have some resources. Uh, the definition of what it means to under... Well, this is actually a paper, what it means to understand a neural network. This is an Encyclopedia Britannica definition. So we have all these different things that, in here. If you want to know about, say, neural networks, you would go to this stub in the directory, and you would look at the neural networks page or a directory. This is just the README. You can add things like, you know, uh, lecture note or, you know, lecture notes or if someone creates a lecture. I would try to stay away from, like, just copying other people's work. Uh, this is just an abstract, so it's not, you know, it's not really that. But I would try to not, like, just put a paper in there wholesale or someone else's presentation. This is a large way, like, pe generate, people generating their own work and putting it into this place. So that's the idea. Um, you know, it's, 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 I think of it not necessarily as like a, just a place to store stuff, but a place where people can engage with topics and sort of interpret it in their own way and put it up there. So again, modeling, we have uh, part of the NMA syllabus, and then we have how to model, which actually is, uh, this is the yeah, this is kind of like the e beginning of the e-neuro paper. We might not want to have that, like, uh, we might want to paraphrase it a bit or, like, build on it somewhat. Um, because, you know, I mean, it's, it, well, there is a copyright issue sometimes. But also, it's the idea is not to just copy other people's work, but to, like, build upon it. So, um, when, but, you know, I think tying it to the syllabus is good. Um, so we might have to fill in some of these other spots like the Bayesian thing with some, uh, some reference to the course. Yeah, a lot of like, what I actually started doing last night was creating the more the broader, uh, folders, um, because I think that was, it's getting to a place where it was like, okay, here's, um, like a specific, like the how to model thing, but I think it's much better to see that in a broader, you know, you, I was look between, between sort of fiddling with that and looking at the actual Neuromatch um, syllabus, you know, there's kind of like a big chunk of stuff on, mod on modeling, and there's a bunch of stuff on, you know, uh, different parts of, of machine learning or neural networks. So it's sort of like, the initial structure that people people see and engage with is it, it's it you don't want to be constructive but you want to kind of i think it's better to have some grouping of things because it was at least to get to the levels of of what you're focusing on down because uh, yeah so, so some of the work was trying to rearrange it and reorganize it in github after that so um, I, I think it's a little bit better now, but I think there's things to be fleshed out and creating uh, more specific, like, uh, child stubs, I think, will be kind of the next step. And also, you know, where people, where people go with it, too, because there's things to be to be added based on what, what people actually want to get into. So. so is this similar to, like... Um, um, Wicked Wikipedia, that is a collaborative effort of the teams and trying to write up like an informative post on different topics in different areas. Well, it's a little bit less for well, it's a little bit less formal than Wikipedia. So, for one thing, this is totally self-directed. So, if people want to explore a certain topic you can create a place for it in in one of those uh, stubs or create your own stub. Say you're interested in, you know, maybe you want to know more about machine learning, but you want to know something maybe about uh, the philosophy of machine learning uh, or some topic there. Uh, now, they're not going to cover that neuromatch, but, you and you know, Wikipedia, there's going to be like a formal uh, stub that you can learn about it, but it's only like one-way learning. It's like you can't really you know, create a bunch of resources around it. So, you know, we, we say, well, you know, if you're interested in this, propose it, just, you know, issue a pull request on some topic, create a stub, and then, you know, it's something that you've created, you've engaged with the literature, and you're making 
questions, comments, and then other people can contribute to that as well. So they can, you know, modify it or they can add to it or ask questions. And then, you know, this will be something that we can use outside of Neuromatch. Like, you know, people want to know about a topic um, and it's pretty obscure and maybe they don't even have a Wikipedia step for it. We can actually have it. Yeah, I feel, I feel like, like it's kind of an interesting mix. mix. Oh, were you saying something, Susan? Or? Oh, I'm just saying, thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting mix because I feel like, you know, I, given that this is, I think there's some experience to be gained from, from doing this as well because, um, uh, like, I think, I think one, one of the, the best, best there's, 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 there's a bit of a usability bottleneck because people kind of need to be familiar with how to edit like GitHub files and, and readme, which which is, you know, I'm sure that it's not everybody is like deeply familiar with that. But at the same time, um, like I think some of the best things would be creating some specific things that you're worried of, like wondering about that may not be the general stuff, even though in a lot of ways, the most general things like, like I know it's simple, but like the, the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, neural network is like actually a really good overview for people who don't really, you know, have any, any real background in that stuff. So, you know, I feel like there's a place, I don't know if eventually it should be divided into like really broad overviews and then specific deep dives or how to do that best. But I feel like those things are also, you know, those are, those are parts of learning too. So I, I would I would encourage people to view the academy as you know if there's something you find interesting about a topic go in and edit those files like nobody owns the epistemological directory is for everybody else to do I actually I almost wonder if just to say this personally I before like weeks ago I made my own folder in the page. And that has my name on it. And that was going to be for some very specific stuff that I was going to do for, for, for the course there. And I wonder if, I don't want that to scare people into thinking that like, this is my, this isn't, this repo isn't like my repo or anything like that. Um, so people are free to go in there and, and edit, you know, within, within the, I mean, I guess the folder is my content, but the, the epistemological directory whole folder is, you know, yeah. for everybody better there. I think, I think the how-to how -to will help, yeah. and I'll add to make issues to that, too. So do we have any other comments or questions on that? Okay. Any other people? Okay. Well, if you have questions after the meeting, you can... Uh, mention them in Slack or email or whatever. And if you if you actually, I'm a fan of like contributing in different ways. So like if you don't feel like you can like make a pull request or uh, write up the you know proper syntax or whatever, then you can submit it like you know uh, on Slack or to me personally I guess, and we can make sure it gets in there. You know just for people to engage with. So we we you know <laughs> there's a philosophy of contributing to like open source projects where you know they try to make it as accessible to a wide range of people as possible so that could mean you know many different modes of interaction so it could be like just doing it the professional way as they say or the you know even doing it in different ways that are not like common but you want to get people involved so um so, thank you um, on that. Uh, now, Jesse, you said you also have five minutes. Why don't we do the five minutes on <clears throat> direct perception, and then we'll move on to the... Basics. Okay, yeah. Um, I I don't know. Are you, you're still here, right, Anson? Yeah. Would you like to help me by situating the question that you had yesterday in the embodied cognition reading group, if you remember? Yeah, so we need the embodied mind, and within, within the book, there's a question, well, the, the authors talk about... They basically, it, it was contrasting Gibson's ecological psychology, and they... Yeah, and the thing is, 
This book, The Embodied Mind, was written in 91, I believe, and Shamero's book was in 90, 2009. So they came before Shamero. Shamero wrote a book called Radical Embodied Cognition, which, which proposes a non-representational version of embodied cognition that integrates um, a lot of Gibsonian, Gibsonian ec ecological psychology, which is a um, approach towards psychology that offers the unique idea of an affordance. As its main, well, as well as its main takeaway. Yeah, and what was interesting in in the Varela book, the which is called the Embodied Mind, um, they were basically saying this critique, almost like a they were using Gibsonian psychology, which which Gibson is a guy who made affordances and and brought into the idea of direct perception, or I don't brought into the idea of affordances based off of direct perception. Um, but Varela was, was trying to differentiate, well, we're not purely Gibsonian about how we view direct perception because they were focusing on this inactive thing. So the question that came up was how it is, how would, how does Shamero in radical body cognition or now like presently, view that difference like is it is is he is he saying yes i'm also believing it's inactive in the same way or is he like no it's purely gibsonian so that was sort of the impetus for some things um and uh, this is gonna this for like a really brief um stuff and i know like for a lot of the new people in the lab i apologize I, this isn't the full presentation that, this isn't the hero that you deserve, um, but uh, it will it come back in, in next week and, and you'll find more of a story. I, I was even going to have more today, but then I didn't get the chance to write some stuff. For, for situating the conversation a little bit more, uh, an activism basically is a... Um, a school of cognitive science that claims that that um, agents agents co-determine their cognition through a, uh, a continue through a um, con continual uh, combined. Uh, in Interaction between. Um, Do they use coupling? Is that what? Yeah, yeah. Coup yeah, yeah. between couplings of an agent and its environment, and it's. I still need a precise definition down, but you see, a lot of it is the idea that you you enact your environment, and that um, it's it seems to be very much. Um, a, a, a non-realist approach that, that, that highly prioritizes or direct phenomenological away, um, perception of environment. Are you, are you hitting your mic, Anson? You seem to be rattling your mic. Sorry. So, so that's where direct perception comes in as a key tenet of an, an activism. As just to situate why direct perception matters, where and what it's part of, and just just to kind of back things up further, like originally this is this was sort of my my vision for going through affordances, um, and I started with one of the biggest questions I had at first was what is direct what is direct perception and sort of what is it, what does that mean? Because I didn't I didn't really. I read I read briefs through Shamero's book and I didn't I really I didn't I either miss or just skip the direct perception chapter so that's that's actually where I am now in this overall flow of things but you know Shamero has a whole chapter on affordances uh, we're covering these topics here uh, and Bradley recently sent me some interesting papers about affordances uh, which which kind of interestingly mesh with uh, like, like one of them is about affordances as being skills-based and, and, and essentially related to behavior. Um, 
and it, it, there's um, there's some interesting potentially cyclical narratives about okay well it's sort of like chicken or the egg in a sense like is it is it the environment or is it the agent who 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 stores the, the perception who, who has the information who's observing like there's there's some of that that I want to figure out but one of the one of the latest things and you guys you know you guys remember that from last week I won't go into that but uh, starting with direct the, I really want to get more into direct perception because some of the this will be my only slide to really discuss today, but but this is kind of um, one of the quotes from the book that that's really standing out for me as they're they're changing what they mean, or at least Shumero, this is Tony Shumero commenting on Gibson, and Information perception is unhappily cannot be measured as long as information can be. I feel like this is interesting for me because this is going back into like a lot of the, you know, some of the core of like information theory stuff. And I guess what I'll just say right now is that my progress in this sense as this is where it's at and the question goes deeper into the rabbit hole and I think I wish I, I wish I had written out here more a lot of the questions that came up essentially yesterday um, because oh I wanted to also put the definition of direct perception for people don't I don't you I don't know how much people here know like about direct perception so is it just something that is sort of not why don't you give a definition? Yeah, let me see if there's still, there's actually, uh, I was using the, um, just so you can read this, uh, yeah, the American Psychological Association, this is pretty decent, oh, it's not showing, uh, share this tab instead, no, so there we go, share this tab. Um, it's, it's, it's a theory of the information for perception is external to the observer. And, and, um, so it's not based on, it, it, that one, that one can perceive the object based on the properties of the distal stimulus alone. So there's no inference, there's no memories, there's no constructing representations. Um, and at the time, when Gibson was getting into his work in 1979, from what I understand, and anybody who knows better, feel free to correct me, um, it was very, it was, it was radical compared to the norm of being very heavily symbolic, and he got a lot of flack for it. So by, 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 by going for direct perception and creating these things called affordances, which sort of this workaround for, okay, well, how, to, like, you know, if, 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 you, if, you're, if you're directly perceiving, what, what is this, how do you, you know, what's going on? And so affordances are sort of this way to explain what was going on um, for an animal to perceive things. So um, I feel like Varela in the Embodied Mind, the first book that we mentioned, is is kind of they're kind of they're trying to say, well, it's actually their whole thing is is the middle way and bridging these two extremes. And I think they basically see it as like pure symbolic reasoning, and then totally just I, I, I wonder what they would say to radical embodied cognition itself, which which is sort of a derivative. But, but they seem to be saying, well, the middle way is you know, uh, I think their critique of Gibson and 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 direct perception and affordances as a way around it is that affordances require interaction, and I think they basically say sensory like it's required to be sensory motor. I think I think one of the things they say. I I I, I wish I had. Uh, Next week, I'll provide the specific quote, but this is one of the things we referenced in the meeting that came to the questions that followed was, they're, they're saying, according to Gibson, apparently, like, an animal can just 
perceive, directly perceive information external to it. Whereas they're saying there has to be some inactive sensory, sensory motor interactivity in order to do it. Like this, not just, and you know, they're differentiating between just these like, I don't know, more static, less interactive things, and then saying, well, it has to be more interactive. So um, that's, that's sort of where things stand. Um, and if you rather have any insight in what you would, in about this, I know you said you've done work sort of on these things, but if you want to differentiate or if you know or would speculate differences from, you know, classic Shannon information of what you're talking about, you can. Otherwise, we can leave it at that and move on to more things. Yeah, I was going to actually make a couple comments on that. Um, so the first one is that I, I kind of came to affordances in a different way. So I came at it from, like, human-computer interaction and human factors. So, like, in those areas, it's much more, like... Uh, you know, operational. In other words, like we talk about affordances and it's the definition is very simple. It's like if something has a handle or if something is like, uh, has like a fate, you know, some mode of interaction. So if a cup, mug has a handle, you, that, that's something you grab and, and you know that you grab it. So you don't have to like learn necessarily. I mean, you have to learn what it is, but it's sort of intuitive to the user, like where to grab something, like a door handle, you know, mm -hmm. push it or pull it or whatever. And so they try to, you know, in, in design, they try to say, well, you know, we should design things that have affordances because it helps people where maybe it's ambiguous. So when you go to a door in a convention center and they have these new ways, new kind of door handles that they put on there, sometimes those become very confusing to people because they don't know whether they should push it or pull it or turn it. And so if you make it obvious in the, just the design feature, then that that's the information in, in contained in that object that you can say, oh, yeah, that's what we do. That's the action I need to perform. And so... It disambiguates stuff. But I like the, you know, I think, yeah, the philosophical aspect of it is much more interesting because it kind of gets into information theory, which is actually the other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, so I don't know how many people are, have, have people heard about information theory? Um, the Shannon information. I have. Uh, okay. No, I haven't gone like greatly into depth, but I know I I listen to a podcast about it, and I'm interested in integrating information theory too. Okay, Angela, have you heard of information theory? Not in great detail, but I have heard of it. Okay, Stefan probably has some. Of it too. Um, so. Yeah, quite yeah. sure what we refer to as uh, information theory as such. Uh, well, like Shannon information and uh, information entropy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I did. So that actually brings me to another. I don't know if we're going to cover this in Neuromatch. I don't think they are, but, um, but this is something that will be probably in, implicit in some of the stuff you learn. <clears throat> so, I mean, Stefan said he wasn't sure what I meant, and, like, a lot of you weren't necessarily sure, but that's kind of the point. Um, <laughs> it's always, it's been an idea that's been very fraught with, like, no one knows what it actually is. So, like, there's a mathematical theory of it, and people say, well, we can figure out information, we can calculate it on some things. There are discrete versions, and there are, uh, you know, continuous versions of it, so... You know, that's not really the problem. The problem is, is really the definition of it. What is it itself? Is this the free energy principle before the free energy principle? Maybe. So Claude Shannon was a interesting guy. He was into like juggling and all these other things. He worked at Bell Labs. Yeah. And he, yeah. But he did that. He created this idea called information theory. And it was based loosely on uh, th uh, like thermodynamics and thermodynamic entropy. So the idea was that if I have a signal that I'm in, this is like in telegraph lines. So this is like, you know, pretty much outside of our experience because that was something that was around a hundred years ago. 
um, you know, I can measure like the signal in the telegraph line and it's a discrete flip of a switch, right? And so if I get a bunch of these signals in a sequence, I can calculate how much information there is by calculating sort of the diversity of the switch. So like if all the signals are like a one, then there's no information in that because I know it's a one, right? If the signals are all zero, then this is a binary switch. The signals are all zero, then there's similarly no information because I know it's always going to be zero. But if there's a, a pattern, actually, if there's a pattern of zero one zero one zero one, then it's pretty that's pretty clear there's no information because I just know that it's just a switch, you know, that goes between zero one zero one zero one. So there's no reason for me to worry about any ambiguity in that signal. Now the problem comes is when you get like regular patterns or random patterns of, of activation. So it's like you might get a bunch of zeros, a bunch of ones, and you can think of it like flipping a coin. So like if you flip a coin a lot and you get like a uh, irregular pattern of, of heads and tails, then there's some information in that. And right away you can see what I'm getting at is that I, I say information, but I'm sort of conflating it with uncertainty and I'm conflating it with randomness. And that's the problem, is that it, it's information, but it's like, A, it's defined in a certain way. But B, there are other things that are going on there. So we use it as a proxy for measuring information, but it's not like information as maybe someone might mean it in perception, or information as someone might mean it in semantic. It's, it's sort of, of, it seems, seems like it's sort of relative, relative to the context, context that it's in, and, and just... just it, it's like, like within a specific, specific you know, unit, unit of time, how, how much is there, there you know, know interesting, interesting variation within it, something like that, versus, versus the standardized, standardized uh, um, you know, uniform, uniform patterns. patterns. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, I mean, and it's not that it's not useful. It's very useful in engineering, right? So we can, we can measure, like, information in, like, like uh, telecommunications or in other areas. And, and we've even used it in psychology to measure like uh, stimulus, uh, short-term memory, they've used it. So, I mean, it's useful, but it's like you have to remember that it's not, like there is a certain aspect to it that's um, really subjective and it doesn't necessarily map well to say any kind of information you want. So that's why I bring it up is because you mentioned that there's this sort of ambiguity between like when I say information, and especially if I talk about something like in information in the environment or information that the brain is processing, do I mean Shannon information? And if I mean Shannon information, then is that really the correct measure of information? Mm -hmm. And so it becomes, I, I, yeah, Anson. I am... I don't, I don't know, know a ton about, about it, but how I have it situated is that its origin was in the transition from analog to digital, and that, um, I believe it was Shannon, created a lot of foundations for the encoding and transmission of digital data. So it's kind of situated in that um, formalization of what used to be analog recorded information and so it's so there's been a lot of different um, innovations and the diverse applications but originally it's it, it's 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 situated in the language of foundation the foundations of uh, di of digital media yeah yeah, definitely. It's it's definitely it's used most useful for that, I think, and then maybe less useful for things like, you know, uh, some psycho some you know psychological principle where you're trying to figure out meaning, or you know maybe some but you know biology they use it, but it's you know maybe for like uh, bioinformatics they use it a lot, uh, but not necessarily for like in physiology as much. It's, you know, it's like people can apply and it's not a problem because it's sort of mathematics, right? I mean, mathematics is about taking a problem and making it into something that you can measure and, and quantify and whatever. But I mean, like it is it is something to be aware of, you know, that it's not 
that there is this, maybe this mismatch. We should always be aware of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, any other questions on that, or? Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody's uh, interest and feedback on this, and I I will have a. a there may be parts to it because I think there's going to be a whole part on just what is direct perception because I think that's a lot of the. It, it, in these in these fields, like I, I refer to them as like as the as the frontier of like all this like cognitive, there's like broadly cognitive science stuff. There's like you have to pick kind of a baseline somewhere and go from it because if you don't, you're just gonna there's gonna be no landmark. So I feel like starting with okay, I originally wanted to talk about affordances, but it reminds me of the old saying like I told you that story to tell you this one. So it's like I have to. I think I'm gonna start with direct perception and go up from there into what affordances are because affordance is, is sort of like a it feels a bit like a battleground almost for information for who has the responsibility for interpreting it for all this like it, it's not i don't think affordance is directly is like the, the greatest concept in the world but the way it's being used by different theories is sort of like oh so at any rate um more to come about that and yeah. I'm sure we'll have some other stuff to talk about today. So it's on my to do list to learn integrate information theory, which I uh, which I had explained as a um, full stack model of cognition as the manipulation of information, and I'm sure there's definitely the weaknesses that uh, Dr. Alicia is mentioning about maybe false analogies, but I, I, I think presenting, I don't know enough context to speak about this precisely, but it's, I, I, if anyone else is interested in integrating information theory or other full stack models of cognition, that's something I'm personally exploring. Um. Yeah, so why don't we move on? And if we have any other questions, we can answer them in Slack or Slack. email. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that, Jesse and Anson. And other people who uh, will have questions or want to contribute that, you know, if, if that's something you want to do, let me know. We can do more on that in, in a future meeting. Uh, Sunidi so actually uh, messaged me the other day and asked me about aging. Oh, yeah. And so... Uh, you're interested in aging? Kind of, yeah. I just went through a couple of papers and I found it slightly interesting. Like aging coupled with maybe neurodegenerative disorders. Like there's a lot of stuff being done about Alzheimer's. But then there are a lot of other you know, disorders that are still unexplored. And I did find out a couple of data sets that I mentioned that there must be some. Uh, I did find a very good paper that has you know, kind of review a lot of data sets that are available. Then there's a lot on Alzheimer's, less on Parkinson's, and rest I didn't find any. So I was thinking about tolerance, aging, and Degenerative disorders, kind of thing. I don't know where to start. That's why I think you like, what exactly should I, you know, look at from a computational perspective. From a computational perspective? Yeah. Do you, okay. Do we know? Or I forget if this, this was, was, if you said this or this was, was uh, uh, is, is, is that related to any of the data at Neuromatch, or is it just something you found? No, I used something like Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It would be cool to talk about that more next time. Yeah. It, yeah. I might actually do a presentation on that, on that, and then also on data, on how to find like data sets and things like that. Because I think that would be useful. I know yeah. in Neuromatch you're going to have like projects where you work from data sets that are public, mm -hmm. but I think it might be good to have background in like public data sets and how to, you know, uh, like the whole idea of open data and and how to get things out of it. So. I, I, we, we'll probably do that either, or maybe next week we'll do that. And uh, yeah. yeah, and we can talk more about the, you know, what, what, how to do this, like how to go through, like kind of organizing what you would need to know. Because I mean, I think it's, it's intriguing, but I think there's some research skills there too that could be, we can, yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Thank you sir for opening a couple of papers. Maybe maybe make a presentation about what I found in case I find something interesting. Yeah, that would be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could put it just, and you just have to put a couple slides just like describe yeah. the, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, that sounds like it's going to be good. Um, and then if anyone else is interested, you can get in touch with Sunidi about it um, on Slack. Yeah, yeah. any ideas, like anything that just comes to your mind, just text me. Yeah. And then it's on Slack, Slack, and you can, can also potentially add it to, like, you, you don't have, have to put it in an error match thing, thing, but you can put it on, you know, you know if you find some things can use it, use, you can store it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just want to double check. So, is there, so you're, I think, so you're interested in looking over data about, the, um, aging and interest in different interpretations of it that could have interesting theses? Yeah, that's actually the main idea behind it. Like, yeah, right now it's just a vague idea. Yeah. I'm hoping to have a big technology. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure, yeah. If, if I have time, I might look at some of it and see if, and maybe brainstorm a bit. But it I'm really busy, but if I have time, I'll look into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I actually know someone, I, I, no promises on this, but I know someone who, um, well, just, just to do an, another Envision plug, um, is Angela still here? I don't know if she's... Yeah. Oh, I, I am here. I met Angela at Envision, and um, Anson, I, I brought him to Envision too. One, the first person I ever met at Envision conference actually is doing... She got the Seal Fellowship, and she's doing specifically stuff on finding aging biomarkers. Uh, so I, I tried to ask her if there's something she'd recommend for you. Uh, so that's kind of a cool. This is that's a very interesting set of topics. Uh, so I, I would, please talk about that in Slack or wherever else. You can make your own. I don't know if you have an aging channel in there or even things related to Diva Worm, but it's something else. But wherever in Slack you want to put it. There can be conversation about that. Yeah, actually, talking about biological side of things, I also have a comment. So recently, I'm I'm actually studying bioinformatics in my major, and recently we were talking about single cell sequencing technology. And so basically, that's the thing that allows you not to just sequence kind of all of the cells in one jar, but put them really single. Each uh, sequence, each uh, single cell um, in some tissue, and, and I just suppose now that there could be, could have been some papers about sequencing the brain tissue um, in this manner. And what it, uh, what is really good about single cells that you not only kind of, so you can actually observe the process of differentiating uh, of the brain cells. Probably. And so maybe just, I, I haven't looked into it myself that much, but uh, if you try to search in some academic engine um, about brain single cell sequencing data or some papers about it, you maybe find some aging related uh, experiments or studies. And that could be also interesting, you know, how uh, brain kind of differentiates and uh, changes in terms of cell, um, cell functions or maybe cell proportion, this kind of thing. Yeah. So the keyword would be single cell sequencing of the brain. Yeah. Thanks. Any other comments? Okay. Well, we can, yeah, we can talk more about this on Slack. I can actually create a channel for aging, um, and then we can comment in there. Um, then the final thing is I wanted to do this presentation on Bayes. Now, I know it's at the top of the hour, but we're going to go, I mean, this won't probably take about 25 minutes, so 
if you need to leave, we'll have it on YouTube. But you know, uh, this will be very interesting. Be worth your time. Yeah. So. Let me. Oh, was that? Oh, I was just going to say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of you doing this, so oh, thank you. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking of watching. So I think I posted the slides in um, in Keybase, in the Keybase channels that we have, and I can share them with other people as well. I mean, I'll share it probably, you know, anywhere, anyone wa if anyone wants to get the link, I can send it to you. So this is something... Um, this is sort of a conceptual view of Bayes, and you're going to talk about Bayes in the Neuromatch um, summer school quite a bit, I think. This is why I did this. Um, but you're going to get like just base, a basic overview of the equations and maybe some things of the brain. I'm just going to go a little bit farther afield in, in terms of what, you know, how it's useful and how to think about Bayesian or Bayesian thinking in general. This is taking a while to load here. Okay. There we go. Put it in present mode. All right. So here is our Let's see. It's taking quite a while. All right, there we go. All right, so this is the uh this is you'll figure out what this is. This is called Bayes' rule. This uh, equation here in, in neon, and we'll talk about that. Um, but that's like sort of the underpinning of a lot of what we're doing in terms of statistics. Uh, so for a more quantitative treatment of Bayesian statistics, there are a couple of different places you can go. So this isn't really intended to be like a quantitative overview where you actually like you know, just get the information you need about statistical methods. So for that, we have some uh, Coursera materials here, Bayesian and Statistics and Analysis, Bayesian Methods for Machine Learning, and then an open course on statistics and hierarchical modeling, which includes a lot of Bayes stuff. Uh, generally, if you Google Bayes and maybe statistics or machine learning, you can come up with some references. Uh, so this is uh, Reverend Thomas Bayes, who is the obviously what uh, Bayesian methods are named after. Um, and he thought of this as sort of a means of reasoning about problems and events. So he wasn't even thinking about it in terms of statistics yet. He was thinking about it in terms of reasoning and, like, logic. And so uh, he thought of it as sort of a mathematical formulation of the scientific method. So, you know, this is like where you test hypotheses or... If you look into uh, philosophy of science, you'll find that there are a lot of different ways to sort of, uh, quote unquote, do science. There are different methods. Hypothesis testing is the most common, but there are other ways to evaluate evidence. And that's what we're talking about. Uh, the world is a series of beliefs. So we believe things about the world. We make educated guesses that then are refined iteratively. So we say, oh, I think this has going to happen. I think this apple is going to fall from the tree. And it either, and then we watch the tree and the apple either falls or it doesn't. And over time, we observe, make observations and then we make maybe a statement of probability and then we calibrate that. And that's the idea behind Bayesian thinking. So it's actually quite subjective. And we make subjective statements about known observed events given a model of events, which is what we'll call our prior. And that's our beliefs about things happening in the world. And those can be a mixture of known and unknown. So our prior can be something we know for sure, like we know how many days and on average a year it's going to rain. And we know something about maybe uh, our local context, where we live. Um, you know, we combine those and we come up with a prior. And then we watch the environment to see if it rains. And then we have what we call posterior, which is the refined belief. Um there are two ways of thinking about statistics generally. You'll find this in the literature. People will uh, have these, what they call a frequentist approach, and then they'll have a Bayesian approach. And this is something you'll find in psychology, for example. People will have this argument about frequentists and Bayesians, and it's, uh, they're just a couple, you know, there, there are a lot of differences, but it, it may seem a lot, very trivial to the beginner. 
So there are a couple of things to watch out for. So frequentists believe, for example, that relevant frequ or relative frequency of events over observations. So uh, if a frequentist would measure sort of the frequency of a coin flip over time. So if you flip a coin a hundred times, they're interested in describing the frequency for which you get heads. Whereas a Bayesian would measure the belief uh, of how many times it will come up heads and then refine that by the observation. And that may seem trivial, but it's just a matter of like basically dispelling any notion of you might pre existing notion you have of how coin flips work. Uh, frequentists uh, think of things in terms of probabilities. So the probability of something happening. Uh, and then Bayesians think in probabilities transformed into likelihoods. And the likelihood comes from this refined iteration of, of uh, observation and belief. Uh, frequentists engage in hypothesis testing, which is where you test a null hypothesis and a, and a hypothesis that you have that's not null. Uh, whereas Bayesians look at hypotheses given data. So it, again, that seems a bit uh, an academic, like an academic distinction, but you have this hypothesis and then you test the data. You don't make any assumptions about a null hypothesis necessarily. You just test your uh, beliefs about something with the data and you look at the, and you refine that over time. Um, then finally, frequentists think about probabilities for independent events and not hypotheses. Whereas Bayesians look for degrees of uncertainty and belief updated with each, each observation. So their belief is has a strength. Uh, it's not just I believe something or not. It's I believe something will happen maybe 60% of the time. And then you test that with observations. And then you refine that. And you get to the actual true probability, which may not even be the true probability, but it's what matches the world. Whereas uh, frequentists will... Uh, look at hypothesis, test the hypothesis to see if it's, you know, rejected or not, and then that will be the statement. Then you can think of that in terms of p-values, um, and so those are the differences there. So there are three steps to building a Bayesian model. Uh, you have this uh, blue function, which are prior beliefs, and this is where you construct a prior distribution. Now this is like, a, it's talking about information theory. This can be very subjective. These can be estimates. These can actually just simply be beliefs that you test. Like if you have a, a belief that, you know, um, something that's like a folk theory or something about, um, you know, maybe if you stress people out enough, they shoot lasers out of their eyes. Okay, that might be a belief. And it seems, seems silly, but you can test that against data, right? Um, so you have this prior distribution. But it has to be a distribution. It has to be like, uh, if I sample things in the world, what's what what the, what's the probability of that happening? Okay, um, and then you have evidence, which is where you compare this prior distribution with empirical evidence. So now the evidence is where you're observing the environment without any sort of model, and you're getting data about that, and you're testing your this evidence against the prior belief. So you're basically evaluating the prior belief with new pieces of evidence. Eventually, you have a distribution of evidence, and you compare it with this distribution, which gives you the posterior beliefs, which is this updated prior. And so if this sounds like dynamic regulation or something like a feedback loop, then it is, because you have prior, you have a prior, and then you have observations, and then you have a prior given data or the posterior, and then you go back, that updates your prior, and then you have an update of data, and so forth. And this is this can go on for many iterations. And we'll see in a minute why that is, or how that, that feeds into like algorithmic thinking. So uh, this is belief modeling. I'm not going to talk too much about this. But we've talked about this in the group about beliefs. Uh, this is a couple of slides on this. Uh, if there's some references on something called argumentation theory, which might be interesting. I think Anson probably particularly um, and there are some ties to Bayesian, not only Bayesian uh, statistics and thinking, but also dempster schaefer theory, which I'm not going to talk about too much here, but just know that this exists, um, and this might help also with thinking about Bayesian approaches as sort of a, 
you know, a, a philosophy of belief or a way to model beliefs. And so uh, we'll, then, well, we'll move on to conditional probabilities. Uh, this is where something that might be of direct use, um, this is the way we formulate Bayes' rule. And so Bayes' rule has a couple of components to it, but it's basically a measure of plausibility. So how plausible is something given prior information, which is A, and empirical information, which is B? So A is your prior and B is your data. And so this is your, uh, so a couple of components to Bayes' rule. This is uh, the probability of your empirical information, whether something occurs or not in nature. Your PA is your prior probability. So this is, you know, coming from your prior, whether you believe something is going to happen or not. Then this is the likelihood. So this is B given A. So this is the probability of uh, B happening given A. So it's the probability of your observation given your, or your observation given your prior expectation. And so then if you do this calculation, you end up with a prior prob or a posterior probability B of A given B. So this is the probability of prior information given empirical information. And so that's how the conditional probability works. Uh, again, this is a very high level. I'm not going to show you how to derive this, but this is basically how it works. Um, this is from deep AI. So again, they're looking at this sort of thing in AI quite a bit. Um, another thing you might run into is called naive Bayes, which is it's uh, a technique where it's a discriminant technique, which means you're kind of trying to sort things into categories and find sort of the margin or the boundary between those things. And so uh, you're using this Bayesian technique to do this classification. And so you, in this case, you'll take all properties of an object, you'll take them independently, and they'll serve as predictors to your model. Uh, you have no prior knowledge of how attributes are related. So that's the naive part. And then the features, when you get your classes, features in the particular class are not related to any other feature. So you would take your features of your object apart. You look at their relationship, or you look at, you use Bayes' rule, you apply it to this, and then you make your classification. And you try not to, you know, worry about how things are related. And so one application naive, naive Bayes is the spam filter. Uh, this is something that's used in, of course, in email applications that sort spam messages from real messages. And of course, as you know, sometimes they fail and you get spam in your inbox. And so they've used naive Bayes as a way to uh, make better spam filters. Uh, you'll have like a prior uh, distribution of things. So this is the probability of a class of spam if we're seeing anything. Then you have the probability of the data, which is, you know, is it spam or not? Uh, there might be things that you might use to sort of mark what a spam message is, or if the user tells the algorithm it's spam. Uh, there's a conditional likelihood of the data given the class. And so, you know, uh, and so it's weighted in that way. And then there's this posterior distribution of probability of the class after seeing the data. And so this is how the spam filter works generally, is you have this message that comes in. It's not, you know, the algorithm doesn't necessarily know it's spam, but it has like attributes maybe of spam. And then you can train the model to say whether something's spam. And then it either it goes into the junk folder or the inbox. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of like conditional probability here I'm not going to get into, but I just wanted to make sure you know what kind of heard of naive Bayes. So let's think about this algorithmically. So this is an example of two distributions, and this is gradient descent. So this is your observation, and this is a prior. And there's something called gradient descent or gradient descent, which is where you're using the prior and the data to kind of reach a point in your uh, landscape here, your uh, uh, gradient where you're doing some sort of gradient maximization or gradient minimization. So if you're familiar with these kind of models, and this is common in machine learning, but people also use it in other fields, you have this landscape of things. It's, it's you know, if things are most optimal or least optimal, or, you know, there's some energy advantage or utility function, it'll be mapped out in this way where you have 
different uh, places that you you know are maximally or minimally representative of a certain value. So uh, the Bayesian, you know, the the method of taking a prior and data and bootstrapping each one off of the other allows you to climb up to these maxima or go down to these minima, which are desirable states for your algorithm. So in algorithmics, you know, you think about like a maximum or minimum point in these landscapes as being where you want to be. It, it's your algorithm is either, op, you know, it's optimizing for something. And so you're going to these points. And so there's this optimization process that goes on. Um, and so one example of this are Monte Carlo Markov chain techniques. And so I don't know if people have heard about that, but this is uh, something you'll probably run into. Uh, this is a way that people use to, uh, if you have this, sometimes, you know, the prior is pretty smooth. It's like a Gaussian distribution, but sometimes it looks like this. It's very irregular or you don't really, it's incomplete in terms of information. You don't really know anything much about your prior. You just know that, you know, it happens sometimes it's sporadic. And so this is what the prior looks like. So in this case, just using a standard Bayesian approach isn't enough. You need to use something that will allow you to converge upon a nice, neat prior or something at least a little bit less uh, nasty than this. This is a nasty looking likelihood, actually. So this is the likelihood is the same problem. It's bimodal. And you want something that's, you know, posterior, that's smooth. And so how do you get there? Well, you use this technique and it's an algorithm that samples data from a probabilistic space. So it resamples your input data. It produces these parameter estimations that approximate a posterior distribution. So this first part where you're sampling your probability space is a Monte Carlo technique. It's just like throwing dice in a casino. And then selection model for the best values of this parameter are the Markov chain, which is a mathematical model that allows you to converge to this minimum point that gives you this smooth posterior, which is not shown here. But that's the idea. So I just wanted to mention briefly about Bayesian networks. This is where you have a couple of things in a network, like different attributes, rain, sprinkler, and grass wet. And you're trying to figure out the causal relationship here. And so you have a bunch of observations. You have a prior uh, idea of how these things are related. And you can test them with data. And it gives you uh, some causality. And then you can apply this method of these small cliques of nodes and, and connections to a bigger network. And I don't know, I don't have any papers on that, but this is basically the idea of Bayesian networks. Um, and then finally, uh, I'll talk about the Bayesian brain hypothesis, which is maybe most relevant to what we'll be talking about in Neuromatch. This is where you have a prior. So the prior is, you know, maybe what I want to do. I want to walk up these stairs. Then there's perception, which is uh, what the brain does as you're walking or as you plan to walk. And the sensory inputs are these, is the uh, posterior. So, you know, you have these, uh, this goal, and then you have what's going on in the brain as perception. And then you have uh, inputs to the, you know, you have sensory inputs. And it's like, it, I guess I think about it in terms of expectation. Your planning is your prior, your perception is this sort of data that's observed. And the sensory inputs maybe are what's, expect or what you actually get as opposed to the expectation so you're expecting something you're getting information into the perceptual system and then there's some action that's planned um it, that actually figure didn't map well to what i was talking about but well it'll become clearer here um one example of this is active inference so now this is the carl friston stuff we're getting into this area of uh, the free energy principle, but this is uh, something called active inference. So this is uh, based on concept learning. So in concept learning, you have, it requires both a type of internal model uh, where the internal model has to expand in some way. So this is adding novel hidden states that explain new observations. Uh, there's a model reduction process that merges different states into one underlying cause. And then Bayesian and meta-learning techniques are used to reduce the model complexity. 
So what that means is that you're if you have a, a model of the world, right? If we go back to this, we have a model of climbing stairs. And then we have the experience of climbing stairs through perception. Then the prior, in that case, you would have, you know, what is the best way to go up the stairs? Um, is it like, you know, crawling or is it walking real fast? Or, you know, what are the, what's the feedback and what's the expectation there? And so, you know, there's a difference between planning things in your head and experiencing them in the world. And so that's kind of what active inference does. It has to expand the number of states in the inter the internal models is how you represent things in your head. It expands the sort of the, the space of expectation. So, you know, if you walk up the stairs and then you suddenly trip, that has to be put into your experience. And so that's what they mean by expanding your internal model. And then you actually have many models that you use that are possible. And then you use this Bayesian type process or this meta learning type process to reduce those down to the ones that are most plausible. And so um, this is a figure on the right. This kind of talks about interoceptive in, uh, inference. This is active inference in a system of interoception, which is how uh, autonomous processes and organs are controlled. So your heart rate is controlled by this autonomous process involving these brain regions, and it operates in the same way as active inference. Um, then there's also predictive processing, which is more uh, sort of in a has a cybernetic flavor to it, where the question is asked, what's the probability of a sensory signal? And so uh, this is the figure here of the system. Uh, there are these error units in orange and the state units in blue, and there's feedback between them. So there's communication uh, back and forth. Uh, there's a prior prediction that's made about the sensory signal and then the sensory signal itself. So they have to match in some way or else there's an error that's generated. And then this difference is actually used to build a posterior distribution of, which is this green figure here, or this green distribution, and that moves your uh, processing of the sensory signal towards the actual signal. So. Predictive processing basically means that you're trying to predict what your sensory inputs are going to look like. And then once you get the information about what they actually are, then it pulls you closer to that, from that estimate to the actual signal. And so there are a lot of ways that can be interfered with. And so one way to do that is to get uh, an artificial, like a virtual reality system, or in this case, an augmented reality system, and you can play around with uh, different parts of that feedback loop and, and the signals. So in this case, you have um, a physical hand versus a virtual hand. And the idea is that you're trying to uh, trick your brain into thinking that this virtual hand is part of your body. And so you can do that, actually. That's a very famous set of experiments where you can uh, encounter a virtual hand in a way that you sort of react as if it's part of your own body. And so this body ownership is this updating of the internal model to include the arm, the virtual arm, which if you just viewed a virtual arm then you know, just on, on a computer screen, you wouldn't think it's part of your body. But if you use it in a way that's interactive, then you'll be able to create that illusion. But that happens through this process of predictive processing and active inference. And so then finally, we can think of the Bayesian brain, and this is for Jesse and Anson especially, uh, as an instance of the every good regulator theorem, which is an idea that we've explored uh, that says that every model is, is a, you know, a model of regulation. So if you have an internal model in your brain, it's actually a model of regulation, um, and that's regulating something. Uh, so in this case, we have an organism, and it's taking in an an approximation of the environment. Uh, it, actually, it's building an internal model from an approximation of the environment. It's then using empirical input to evaluate that model, and then it's making a copy of the model that matches the environment, and there's feedback to this original internal model. And you, know, you can think about this in experiments or in like a computational model, but that's basically the idea. And so that is all I have, and I think that was pretty quick.
but I kind of hope people get a, a decent idea of uh, not just like you know how to do Bayesian uh, techniques or how they're important, but maybe you know where they apply in the world. That was like exactly twenty five minutes. That's yeah. okay. welcome. I have to get to that level of. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's cool. Um, and, and the 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 there's this is really cool because it, it's like this. Uh, it's tying into so many other things. Even even the uh, the hand, the virtual hand, like that's like ready to hand stuff. Um, in, in in like affordances and like are you, when you're riding the example of riding your bike, are you thinking about riding your bike? Or not? Like, are you thinking, thinking about, about the hand is part of you, or not? Like, like it's just there. there. Uh, uh, so this ties into a lot of things. things. It doesn't. It, it may not seem like it, but everything that, pretty much everything that we talked about today is like extremely related to each other, from forces to the Bayesian stuff. So that's it's really cool to see that. I and there's a bunch of other papers that come to mind, but I'll I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments? I really appreciate the presentation. I definitely need to like review the technical side of it more, but I think the um, the conceptual connections and applications were thoroughly reviewed, and, and I'm interested. It's a very good toe in the water for diving into what more. Um, I could, I could utilize here because a lot of it is really relevant for what I'm interested in. And I appreciate you putting this presentation together for us. Yeah, yeah I, I got it, but I'd like to you know, get into the depth, but you kind of got me involved into it. Like, you explained it really properly and, you know, the sling stuff. So, yeah, it was good. Thanks. Yeah, this is sort of my first introduction to Bayesian theory, and I, I think it's a very good bit of deep end introduction to what's what's coming. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I know for a fact that um, on week two, I think day three of your match, because I was editing Cording's slide, trying to offer some copy, and like, we're going to go into it there. And I'm I'm really curious if I don't yet know. If anybody, if anybody here or season knows, knows like, like, are the are projects, projects defined yet? yet? And are, like, is there something like, I, I, I don't know what, what, I know there's data sets they're supposed to use, uh, uh, but I don't know, know uh, if, if, if there's an obvious tie between like, like the, like the Bayesian like brain, brain stuff and some, some of the data sets are not, I don't, I don't know what available. I was curious in the sense of, I'd like to use some applications along the lines of Bayesian stuff. Yeah, I, I don't really know either, but I'm pretty sure. I, I think they have some kind of different project. I think, but I'm not quite sure. But they, they, when I checked today, it was to be announced till now. I did check after they contacted us, but there's nothing there yet. Um, that might be something good to ask your client. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little, I'm, as a side note, I'm, I'm a little bit like uneasy because I haven't heard from them and I've been asking everyone. It's like, oh, you know, at the latest here is like, wait a little bit longer because they're switching out a bunch of stuff. So hopefully it's just a matter of that. And yeah. Yeah, I think that it would be good. I mean, it's all tricky because it's like, you know, you have to have a prior and you have to, uh, you know, set your data out in a certain way. Like I said, I didn't really go through like how you would build a, you know, a notebook where you would actually do the analysis. But that's something I think we'll, they'll probably talk about in Neuromatch itself. And then, you know, there, there are a lot of other caveats to actually doing the analysis. But I think it's, you know, it's useful as sort of a conceptual tool and a statistical tool. So uh, definitely if you're interested more, there's more reading that, you know, both in terms of like, there, so, there's software for implementing it, for example, but there's also like a lot of other, there are other applications. I know that predictive processing is something that we're going to cover in the other reading group as after the kind of the thing we're relating to, right, Ethan? Um, so it, it, it's, it's, 
it's nice that it comes up here too. I, I think I don't know. I don't. I don't know how much that's gonna come in Neuromatch, match, but like in the post Neuromatch match era, like I think that'll definitely be something that we go into, or at least related. Some of the more like a lot of the things lately that I like I've been talking about, they they've been more philosophical than technical, but I I want to get into actually working out the modeling of this and and getting getting simulations and some of the actual like actual data science behind these things too. So. Okay. Well, if you have any other questions, actually, we can probably do it in Slack if you want, or in by email or something. And uh, yeah, so yeah, keep thinking about things. And uh, so next week we will talk about. Um, we'll have uh, Suniti or we'll give a short presentation. Doesn't have to be very long. And then I'll probably give some uh, background on that as well. And then if we have any other questions, we can address them. If Jesse wants to continue a little bit with a little bit more on the uh, stuff that the maybe, perception maybe. or whatever, maybe we'll see. Uh, <laughs> also, also, I would say, say like, like Neuromatch is nine, nine days, days away, so anything, anything you want to talk about from Neuromatch before then, like, 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 it's going to be here fast, fast, so. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll have stuff to talk about then, but. Yeah, next week, well, I don't know if it'll be the. A last meeting before Neuromatch itself, but it's coming up. So yeah, if you have something you want to discuss, we can probably make time for it. Well, thank you for meeting. Uh, sorry about the technical glitch, but... <laughs> Thanks for showing all the new people that I nudged or whatever, and, and people, and it's great to see Stefan again. Any, any, any updates from you, Stefan, or how's your math stuff going? Or if you're still here. Uh, that film was like the like major centerpiece to our lab last year. year. Uh, uh, like he, he was a spearhead on our last, last year's Google year Summer Code project. project. So he's like, you know, yeah, yeah, he's very knowledgeable about a lot of the stuff that's going on here. Yeah, good to see you again, Stefan. Um, okay, so uh, thanks for attending, and we'll talk. We'll uh, meet next week. I'll send out an email. Have a good week. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. 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 bye.